welcome to the hematologic system overview. The hematologic system is not a simple system, but it is so imperative that you understand kind of how it works, that you understand what's behind the scenes, because really this is what binds all our systems together. This is what makes our system one big orchestra. So without each of these aspects of the system doing its thing, you are not going to have a system that's functioning or that has homeostasis. So let's take a look at specifically the, the uh, functions of the hematologic system that we're going to take a look at even further and that also provides the basis, the foundation for all the subsequent units that we're going to discuss. Clot formation and dissolution, we're going to talk about the formation of the platelet plug, platelet being one of the formed elements of the whole blood, which we're going to talk about in a second, and also your responsibility in administering those antiplatelet drugs, those anticoagulant drugs, serious implications for care. As you know, those are high-risk medications. That's on your little list of high-risk drugs, so you know it's important. Oxygenation. That's what it's all about, right? Ladies and gentlemen, without oxygenation, you're not going to have normal cellular metabolism and you're going to have cell death. So that's pretty important. Transport. Again, the transport mechanism of the blood is what ties in all our systems. It makes us whole and connected. Okay, so let's look at the components of whole blood. So 55% of whole blood, of the weight of whole blood, is comprised of plasma. So plasma is 92% water. So it's mostly water. 6% of that plasma are plasma proteins. 2% are solutes. What's the rest of whole blood are called the formed elements. So the formed elements are the solids of the blood. And then we're going to take a really close look at the platelet or the thrombocyte the white blood cell or the leukocyte and the erythrocyte or the red blood cell. So what's fascinating to me about this is that, okay, you have 6% of all of this weight is proteins, only 6%. And yet if you have a deviation in what we know to be normal levels of any of this, you're not going to have homeostasis. So albumin, for example, what's the role of albumin in the blood? Oncotic pressure, that pulling power for water. Without albumin, you're not going to have transport because you're not, not going to have anything that stays in the intravascular space. There's nothing to pull it and keep it in there. So albumin normal levels, 3.5 to 5. So you know when you are, or your patient is hypoalbuminemic, you're going to have some issues with extravascular weight and volume, lower extremity edema, and problems with perfusion, blood pressure, transport. So albumin is so essential for this orchestra to all communicate with one another. Okay, so let's look now at solutes of the blood. So there's all these different types of solutes and yet, it's only 2% of that whole blood. 2% is all of it. So when you take a look at just one in our list, the ions, well, what's an ion? A positively charged ion. Potassium, sodium, calcium. Hopefully you know all those normal values to memory. There are some things you do have to memorize for this licensing exam and the normal values of your metabolic panel and your complete blood count is definitely on the list of things to memorize. So potassium being 3.5 to 5, if that normal level of that positively charged ion deviates from 3.5 to 5, you're going to have some serious issues with cardiac conduction, which leads to problems with perfusion, which could lead to death. So my point is, and I hate to be uh, so heavy, is that you need to understand how each aspect of this blood plays such an imperative role. And so the identification of whatever is deviating is one of our essential functions at the bedside. 
nutrients, waste products, blood urea nitrogen, uric acid, this is like the stuff we need to rid because it damages organs and it disrupts homeostasis. Lactate, for example, we're going to talk about when anaerobic metabolism takes place and the byproduct of that is lactic acid. Well, now not only do we have hypoxemia, now, and which is a disruption in oxygenation, now we're going to have a disruption in acid-base balance, a metabolic acidosis on top of your severe hypoxemia. So my point is that every one of these components, again, is so essential for homeostasis. The gases, oxygen, CO2, the delivery of oxygen to the cells for cellular metabolism and then the carting away of the waste product of that cellular metabolism in the form of carbon dioxide or, carbon dioxide or CO2. Regulatory substances, oh my gosh, the hormones in the system, again, that system, the endocrine system, which releases those substances that act either on a cell or an organ in order for some effect to take, to take place. That's the endocrine system. Without the precise amounts of these hormones at the precise time that they should be released, you're not going to have homeostasis and you're going to have disease. So again, this is the basis for every subsequent system we're going to talk about. Okay, so let's take a look now at the formed elements with the platelet or the thrombocyte. The platelet is one of the formed elements that is essential for normal clotting processes. Without the platelet to release that sticky substance, you're not going to have the platelet plug form, which is the first step in fibrin clot formation. So that's just your overview, and we're going to talk a little bit more about it in a few minutes. The leukocyte is the white blood cell. Now, again, you're going to have to know normals of these formed elements, the platelets, as we just spoke about, not to backtrack a little bit, but make sure you are very familiar with normal platelet values being 150,000 to 350 thousand. Not sometimes you'll see 150, but that's just um, an abbreviated way to say 150,000 because it's assumed we know there's the platelets are in the thousands. Okay, so back to the leukocyte. So the leukocyte is the white blood cell normal being 5 to 10,000. So without being able to recognize the normal values, you're not going to be able to identify when there is this absence of normal physiology pathophysiology. Again, this section is behind the scenes. It's the most um, complex because it's not something that jumps out at you like, this is what's wrong in the immune system. This is what's wrong with my clotting. You're going to have to dig deeper and look at these things. Unlike other diseases, I love the example of liver failure patient because whatever is going wrong pathophysiologically that patient's going to present with those clinical manifestations. So it's so much easier to illustrate it literally and figuratively. Okay, so when it comes to the white blood cells, there's all these different types of white blood cells. And you need to be a little more familiar with some of them than others. The neutrophil is, they call it the immature white blood cell. Why? Because it's not going to begin to multiply unless an acute infection is present. So we know when the neutrophil is elevated, then an acute infection is possibly pending. We'll skip over the lymphocyte for one second. The monocytes and the eosinophils and the basophils, you know, we just check in with them every once in a while. We don't pay a lot of attention to them up close and personal at the bedside. But we need to know they're there. We need to know they're doing their job of phagocytosis. The lymphocyte. Okay, we're going to talk about the lymphocyte because it does have real clinical relevance for us as we look at disease and hypersensitivity disorders in particular and allergy and anaphylaxis, which is the extreme form of allergy also. Okay, so... Just to backtrack one second again to these regulatory substances, one of them in particular being erythropoietin. Where is erythropoietin secreted from? From the kidney, from the renal system. So you see how it is all 
very much involved with each other. All the organ systems talk to each other through hormones. So just take a look at the bone marrow for a second because the bone marrow is where all of the formed elements are manufactured. So when you have bone marrow suppression and what types of disorders or diseases or circumstances will suppress your bone marrow, chemotherapy, um, bone marrow cancers. So when you have a suppressed bone marrow, you have what's called pancytopenia. And I always draw a pan for my students. You know, here's your pan and you're cooking up some whatever it is, the eggs, and you've got your eggs and you've got your ham and you've got your cheese and it's all in there. But in this context, you've got your platelets and you've got your red blood cells and you've got your white blood cells. They're all being cooked up because they're all down. They're all going away. So that's pancytopenia. Um, the red blood cell for a minute or the erythrocyte. Now the erythrocyte is what carries the hemoglobin. In fact, one erythrocyte carries 300 hemoglobin molecules. And you need to be very familiar with the clinical significance of the hemoglobin the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Clinical relevance for you is that when you're administering to your patient packed red blood cells, that's why you need to restore their oxygen carrying capacity of their blood. Let's look at these other players just for a minute of the hematologic system, the spleen. The spleen is very important for immunity because it does provide a filter for blood and it is also what stores the old components of red blood cells and platelets. The liver, oh my god, I just love talking about the liver. Because again, when you have a patient in liver failure, there it is. It's all out there for you. You can see everything that's going wrong with their liver by looking at them. But we'll get to that. Prothrombin, that's a plasma protein. Guess where it's made? The liver. Love that organ. Albumin, guess where albumin is manufactured? In the liver. So if you have liver failure, you're going to have a diminished amount of all these plasma proteins. Yeah. The liver also manufactures bile. Why is that even significant now in this series? Because without bile, you are not able to absorb fats. Okay, that's indigestion or fat-soluble vitamins. Fat-soluble vitamins. Let's think about which ones are they? A, E, D, important, 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 and K. Very important. Without the absorption of vitamin K, what do you get? Bleeding. So this all ties in.